The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve, serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Hello, Avenue. We've been working our way through this letter of 1 Peter for quite some time now. We started looking at it together back in the month of September. And in the verses we're looking at today, Peter is heading towards the end of this letter, written to Christians scattered across what was first century Asia Minor. And in just five short verses, Peter packs in a lifetime of practical, loving wisdom to help his readers live together in such a way that God receives the glory. I mean, look at how he ends this short section in verse 11. Peter's busy saying, commit yourselves to living together in the way I'm describing so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. See, Peter wants to remind the Christians he's writing to here, including Christians reading this letter today, the great purpose and goal of the Christian life, the great purpose and goal of any local church that claims to follow Jesus. And that purpose is that the God of grace will receive glory through our life together as we seek to worship Jesus and as we live as Jesus witnesses in this world. And I want us to imagine together, as we listen to this short passage in 1 Peter 4, that we're sitting at the Apostle Peter's feet. And we're learning from him as an older, wiser believer, what a church family on mission together looks like. See, as elders at Avenue in recent months, we've been praying and discussing what our goals should be for the coming years. See, we want to grow two flourishing gospel churches, one at Avenue in Clarendon Park, the other on the Heirs Monsell Estate. So as we listen to 1 Peter chapter 4 together, what advice would Peter give us as we work towards that goal? According to Peter, what exactly does a healthy, flourishing gospel church look like? So I think Peter gives us a glorious picture of one. In these verses. So please have your Bible open, 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. Now, in this passage, Peter basically gives us four marks of a healthy church. Now, there are books out there that claim there are nine marks of a healthy church, but I'm just looking at 1 Peter chapter 4. And the first mark of a healthy church is in verse 7 Be a church that is quick to pray, says Peter. Be a church that is quick to pray. Now look at how Peter opens verse 7 here. He says, the end of all things is near. Now, when we first hear Peter use those words, we might be tempted to think of him as that sort of crazy bloke standing on a street corner somewhere with a sandwich board with the words on it, the end is nigh. I mean, why does Peter open his teaching about a healthy church in this way? We see Peter wants Christians to understand where they fit in God's great story of salvation. He wants Christians to see that we live towards the end of that great story. See, Jesus has come. Jesus lived and died and rose again to defeat sin and death. Jesus sent us his Holy Spirit to equip us and empower us to live as his witnesses in this world. And one day soon he will return to judge the living and the dead. See, Peter wants to encourage his Christian readers here. You're on the home straight. You're nearly home. Or to steal Dan's brilliant illustration last week of Florence Chadwick, the swimmer. You've nearly reached the shore. Therefore, 
Peter urges his readers, be alert and of sober mind that you may pray. See again, Peter's been clear throughout this letter. The Christian life is often hard. The Christian life will involve suffering because we worship and follow a saviour who suffered. Jesus Christ, the son of God who suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow. So how should we respond to suffering and struggle in our lives? Well, Peter tells us here, we need to be a church that is quick to pray. Prayer is essential in the Christian life. And more and more, prayer needs to be the first resort of Christians, not the last resort. I mean, look at how Peter describes the attitudes that will lead us to pray in verse 7. Be alert, he says. That could be translated, be clear-minded. Be of sober mind, he says. That could be translated, be self-controlled. See, by calling us to grow in these attitudes, Peter's acknowledging neither of them come naturally to us. In fact, we often tend to the opposite of these things. So instead of being alert or clear-minded when we struggle, we, we tend to panic. We tend to catastrophize and just stress. And instead of being sober-minded, well, we tend to sort of live in denial, to stick our heads in the sands, to procrastinate, to avoid harsh realities. See, to put Peter's command in another way, he's saying when life is hard, don't panic Don't live in denial. Instead, pray about it. Tell God what's going on. Talk to him and ask him to help you live for him in the midst of it. Don't panic, says Peter. Keep your head. Don't fret. I mean, speaking naturally, when when things are hard, I am very prone to panicking in my life. I worry. I get stressed and anxious. I start imagining the very worst that could happen will happen. And instead of my worry leading me to prayer, it often just leads me to stew in my fears. But see, Peter urges us here, when you're finding it hard to live for Jesus, don't panic. Instead, pray about it. Talk to your Father in heaven. Tell him what's on your mind. Cry out to him to help you. And then Peter turns to the opposite, but equally wrong tendency we can have in difficult times. Don't live in denial. Be of sober mind, he says. Don't ignore what's happening around you. Don't hide from what's happening, whether in busyness or family commitments or TV or exercise or alcohol. Instead, pray about what's happening. Talk to your father in heaven. Ask him to help you. See, in verse 7, Peter's urging his readers, if you want to live as a healthy church community, be quick to pray. Make prayer your first resort rather than your last resort. And Peter knows what he's talking about. Again, you look over the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and Peter there, he's often the embodiment of self-reliance, of trying to fix things on his own. So Jesus is being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter rushes in to save the day by chopping off the ear of the high priest's servant. It achieves nothing. Peter then follows Jesus to his trial, maybe thinking he can do something, but the minute someone confronts him, he denies ever knowing Jesus to save his own skin. It's as if Peter is leaning on his own experience here when he urges us, don't panic, don't live in denial, pray. Don't rely on yourselves, Christians. Stop imagining you can fix things on your own. You can't. You'll only make a terrible mess. Trust me, says Peter. I know what I'm talking about. So Peter urges us here, be clear-minded rather than panic. Be sober-minded rather than living in denial. Above all, be quick to pray. Be quick to bring your concerns, your worries, your fears to the God of grace who loves you. And who alone has the power to help you. So how do we respond to Peter's words in verse 7 here? What small steps can we take even in the coming week to begin to apply this more to our lives? Well, I want to challenge you for this week. Just I challenge myself. When you're facing a difficult situation 
or a difficult relationship or a difficult decision in the days ahead. Pray about it early on. Don't make prayer the last resort. Don't try to fix it yourself. Don't look for the advice of every other human being in the world before you turn to prayer. Don't be quick to pray. Be alert, be self-controlled, recognize your need and recognize the God who alone can meet that need. Don't just sit there, pray something, says Peter. Doesn't have to be a long prayer. Just, Father, help me in this. I don't know what to do. That is a great prayer of faith. A healthy, flourishing gospel church, says Peter, is one that is quick to pray. And the second mark of a healthy church is in verse 8. Peter urges his readers here, be a church that loves each other deeply, verse 8. Be a church that loves each other deeply. Again, look at verse 8. Peter opens this verse with a huge statement designed to make us sit up and pay attention. Verse 8, he says, above all else, do X. Now, I wonder if you were writing to a group of Christians, how would you finish that sentence? Above all else, teach the Bible faithfully. Above all else, be creative in your evangelism. Get the gospel out. Above all else, care for the poor. Get involved in justice ministries, in social action. Now, all those things are good things for a church to be involved in. At Avenue, we are committed to all these things as best we can be. But Peter knows the only way we will do any of those things well, the only way we'll be able to live out our identity as God's people in this world, is if we love each other deeply. In the original Greek here, there's a sense in which Peter's urging us literally to love each other at full stretch. Love each other even when it hurts, even when it's costly. And why did Peter say that as of such primary importance in the life of the church? Well, Peter was there that night, the night before Jesus went to the cross, when Jesus opened up his heart to his disciples. In John chapter 13, Peter said this, or Jesus, sorry, said this to his disciples. A new command I give you, says Jesus, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, Jesus told Peter and the other disciples that night, love is absolutely vital to our mission together as Christians. Learning just how deeply Jesus has loved us and then learning from Jesus how to love one another deeply. And it's as we learn to love each other deeply as Christians that people outside of the church get to see that Jesus is real. Love each other deeply, Peter urges us, because only then you'll be in a position to share the gospel with the people around you. See, love each other deeply, says Peter, because it's vital to our mission as a church. But Peter also knows loving each other deeply is vital if we're going to keep going in the Christian life. See, again and again in 1 Peter, I hope we've seen if you've been here with us, life in a fallen world is often hard and the life of a Christian in particular is often hard. Peter's very clear about that. Peter knows that Christians are often looked down on, marginalised, mocked by the people around them. And as a result, we all need the love and support and encouragement of fellow believers with us. So to put it starkly, we just aren't going to make it on our own. And we were never meant to. So we need to commit ourselves to loving one another deeply at full stretch because the Christian life can be hard. That's why it's so important that we keep meeting together as a church, even in these strange times. Why we need to get together with each other on Zoom 
in our home groups, maybe going for a walk with one other person. That's why messaging each other throughout the week is so important. Let's be getting in touch with each other via WhatsApp, Facebook, on the phone. And let's be asking each other the simple questions. How are you? How can I be praying for you? Here's how you can be praying for me. So love each other deeply, says Peter. It's vital for our mission as a church and it's vital for us to be able to keep going as a church. But Peter gives us another reason why we need to commit ourselves to loving one another deeply in verse 8. And it's a striking one. Verse 8 again. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Peter tells us to love each other deeply because there are always going to be sins you need to forgive other Christians for in a local church. It's a powerful thing, isn't it? Now, plenty of churches today have strap lines, kind of phrases that are meant to sort of capture something of what that church is all about. Our strap line at Avenue currently is enjoying life-changing relationships with Jesus. Strap lines can be really helpful. But according to Peter here, an accurate strap line for any and every church could be something like this. Avenue Community Church, join us and experience a multitude of sins. It's a remarkable statement, isn't it? When you put it like that, sort of, it's fairly shocking. I mean, what does Peter mean by that? Well, I think it's clear to me what he doesn't mean. Peter's not talking about unrepentant sins here. He's not urging us to turn a blind eye to things like anger, bitterness, greed, violence, sexual immorality, gossip. See, Peter, like the rest of the biblical writers, takes sin very seriously. Just look back at chapter 2 verse 11 as an example. Dear friends, he writes, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. See, again and again in Scripture, the loving response to unrepentant sin is to confront it, to challenge it, to bring it into the light and urge people to turn away from it. So what is Peter referring to in this phrase, a multitude of sins? Well, I think he's referring to the 101 small ways in which Christians let each other down regularly in a church family. I think he's referring to the times when we say the wrong thing that ends up hurting someone. When we try to help and we make a mess of it. When we forget to message someone when we said we would. When we get so obsessed with our needs and our struggles that we forget all about the needs and struggles of the people around us. So according to Peter, how does love respond to those 101 ways in which we let each other down as Christians? Well, the answer is love covers over them. Love forgives them. Love lets them go and remains committed to the other person. Again, we need to be clear about something. Love doesn't cover up sin or turn a blind eye to it. Unrepentant sin ruins lives. It causes misery. It has to be confronted and turned away from. But where sins are acknowledged, where they're minor and everyday, love is willing to let go of them and move on. Love refuses to hold a grudge or let it fester and grow. Love forgives one another just as the Lord forgives us. We always need to remember in Christ, God has covered over a multitude of sins in each of our lives out of his great love for us and at great cost to himself. And Peter urges us here to follow in Jesus' footsteps and learn from him how we can forgive one another. So what practical small steps can we each take in the coming week to love each other deeply? Well, I wonder if we just need to start with the people closest to us. Start with your family, with the people in your home group, with your husband or your wife, with your colleagues. Ask God to grow in you a deep 
love for them. Ask him to teach you how to forgive them when they hurt you, as they will, as you often hurt them. Ask God to show you how love covers a multitude of sins and remains committed to the other person, just as God in Christ is committed to us. Ask God to show you how to love the people in your life deeply in the days ahead. Now, the third mark of a healthy church, Peter gives very much follows on from this command to love each other deeply in verse 8. Turn, turning to verse 9, Peter basically says, Be a church that is open hearted with one another. Be a church that is open hearted with one another, verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling, says Peter. Now, we need to notice something. When Peter talks about hospitality, he doesn't describe it as a spiritual gift that some Christians have and other Christians don't. I mean, Peter turns to spiritual gifts in verses 10 to 11. No, in verse 9, every Christian is called to show hospitality to one another. That's whether they're an extrovert or an introvert, whether you're married or single, whether you've got a big house or live in a tiny flat. And in a normal time and season of life, that's a fairly easy verse to apply. We basically say, offer hospitality to one another, open up your homes to other believers, have them round for a meal, for a coffee, for a games night. But of course, we're not living through ordinary times at the moment. In response to COVID-19, we're told not to have people in our homes at the moment. So what does verse 9 mean for us in the middle of a pandemic? Well, at its heart, Christian hospitality is about welcoming one another into our lives. So even when we can't open up our homes to one another, we can open up our lives to one another. Open up your lives to other believers, says Peter. Welcome one another. Let other people into your joys and your struggles. And Peter urges us, do all this without grumbling. Again, why does he add that that qualifier? Well, again, think back to verse 8. When when Peter calls us to love each other deeply, he's clear that's going to be costly. Welcoming other Christians into our lives can get messy. I mean, just literally when we do it in our homes, they, they bring their messy shoes into our carpets. They spill coffee on our sofas. Other Christians will complicate your life. And in many ways, your life would be easier without them. Peter knows how easy it is to grumble about other Christians, so he urges us here not to do it. Now, this is a hard command for us to follow in our culture. Culturally, British people love to grumble. It's something that unites us. It's like a national pastime. So we grumble about the weather or about the government or about our families or jobs. We don't think it's a big deal. But I want us to see here, God does think it's a big deal. Throughout the Bible, God takes grumbling seriously. Why? Because grumbling people aren't thankful people. Grumbling people aren't seeking to love that person they're grumbling about deeply. And they're not trusting that God may be doing things through having that grumbling, difficult person in our lives. So instead of grumbling about one another, Peter urges us, be open-hearted with one another. Open up your life to one another. So again, maybe a small step we can take in this direction. Maybe the next time you speak to another Christian, just try and open up about one thing that's important to you. It could be something you're really thankful for at the minute. It could be something you're struggling with at the moment. That feels risky. It's scary to open up about something dear to us. But by doing so, you're encouraging the other person that they can do the same thing. You're encouraging the people around you to open up their lives too. And the result of that is that you're all better equipped to love and pray for each other as you seek to follow Jesus in this world. So Peter urges us, offer hospitality to each other. Be open-hearted to one another. And finally, that final mark of a healthy church, Peter calls us to here. Be a church where everyone uses their gifts to serve others. That's verses 10 to 11. Be a church where everyone uses their gifts 
to serve others. Again, Peter's been clear throughout this passage, throughout this letter, in order to grow and keep going in a fallen, often hostile world, Christians need one another. Every believer has a part to play in loving and serving the others. None of us can live for Jesus as his witnesses on our own. We need the gifts and the support of one another. Look at verse 10 again here. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. See, amazingly, according to this verse, God demonstrates his grace towards us through other Christians he's placed in our lives. So Peter urges us, use your gifts to serve others so that God receives the glory. Use your gifts, says Peter. According according to Peter here, God loves to give gifts to his people. And it's clear that any gift you have received from God is to be used to help bless other people. It's not there primarily for you to feel good about yourself. It's there to be used for the good of others, to serve others. And in verse 11, Peter gives us two broad categories for the gifts God gives to his people. Speaking and serving. So verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Now speaking here could refer to preaching and teaching in the church like I'm doing now. It could refer to reading the Bible, the the very words of God with other Christians, whether it's in a home group or in a one-to-one. It could even refer to those everyday conversations we have together as Christians as we seek to point one another to the truth of who God is and how deeply he loves us. St. Peter urges us here, use your speech to love one another deeply. Build one another up, point one another to the God of grace. And then further on in verse 11, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. See, serving here refers to loving and helping one another through practical care. So in a church family, don't just say you love one another deeply. Show that love in your actions. And again, there's so many ways we can serve one another in a church like Avenue. We can love and teach the children and young people in our church family through getting involved in things like Sunday morning shake-up and source and mentoring teenagers. When we start meeting together in person again, whenever that may be, we need one another to to clean up before and after the service, to welcome people as they arrive, to help with technology, PA, live streaming, to play in the music group. And often the, the biggest way we can love and serve other people around us is just by being there on a Zoom call, in your home group, to encourage and spur one another on. See, when it comes to speaking and serving, Peter's convinced every one of us has a part to play in building God's church. Every single one of us is involved in God's saving purposes for his people. And then Peter finishes this section of his letter by reminding us why all of this matters. Why all of this is so important. He reminds us what the Christian life is all about and what the life of any local church belonging to Jesus should be all about. The goal of everything we do in our life together has to be worship. The goal is that God receives glory through our life and mission together as his people. Again, if you're And it's like me, there are times you will wonder, why on earth did God put me on this planet? I want to suggest Peter answers that question at the end of verse 11. According to Peter, you were put here on this planet to glorify God, to worship God for his grace towards you and to enjoy him forever. Look at verse 11, the goal of our life together as a church family is so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Again, we've seen in this short passage, in these verses, Peter wants to help his readers understand what our priorities should be as a gospel church. Peter urges us here, live your lives together in such a way that God receives glory through you. 
Be a church that is quick to pray. Be a church that loves each other deeply. Be a church that is open-hearted with one another. Be a church where everyone uses their gifts to serve others. And I want to tell you, have a new church family, looking over this passage ahead of today, I have been so encouraged to think, actually, I see God doing this already in our life together. I see people in our church family seeking to live out these priorities that Peter describes here. And I thank God for it. I need you to encourage me in that. But have a new church family, let's all commit ourselves to growing in these areas that Peter points us to here. And let's do so so that people are saved through our witness and so that God receives all the glory he deserves. That is our calling, to worship him, to bring glory to him and to enjoy him forever. Look again at how Peter ends this passage. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Oh,